And so alcohol has a lot of different effects. Um, the, the journalist Stephen Brown has called it a, a pharmacological hand grenade. It just kind of goes in and starts hitting all the buttons at once. It's really, a, it's, a, it's a messy drug. Um, so it is in various timings and ways. It, it simulates the effects of meth and cocaine, Prozac, uh, Valium, Opium is doing all of these things and at various points as, you, as your BAC uh, increases. But crucially, and what's gonna be crucial for the story I'm telling today, is that it depresses the prefrontal cortex. It depresses the motor cortex as well, which is why you shouldn't drive and you have trouble speaking at a certain point of inebriation. But crucially, it's down-regulating that, that part of our brain temporarily. And, and the nice thing is it does it gently, it does it predictably, and it does it with pretty um, uh, short uh, half-life. You, you recover very quickly. So it's, it's actually a, a brilliant technology for, for taking the PFC offline temporarily. And what does that give you? It gives you creativity. So this, there's this association you see across the world throughout history of creative types, artists, writers, poets, with alcohol. You see it in ancient China, you see it in, in the ancient Mideast, you see it in the present day. This is not a myth. There actually is a very good reason why alcohol is associated with creativity in artists. It's because it actually does make us more creative by downregulating the prefrontal cortex. Now, in terms of direct evidence of this, there's not a whole lot right now. Um, this is a nice study I like uh, by Michael Andrews looking at correlation. He's taking advantage, he's an economist, and he took advantage of this great natural experiment, American prohibition. So we tend to think of prohibition as something that happened all at once at the federal level. Just suddenly no one in America could drink. And it wasn't like that at all. It actually took a really long time to impose prohibition and it was imposed piecemeal at the county level. So he was able to look at county level data and what he was looking at was patent applications as a, as a proxy for innovation. And he could look at patent applications at the county level. And what he saw is that when you impose prohibition on a county, patent applications plunge. Collective innovation plunges. And then it slowly recovers. It took about three years to get back to pre-prohibition levels. He, his hypothesis is speakeasies, <laughs> is, is why that happened. So basically, <laughs> prohibition comes in, you can't drink socially anymore, innovation goes down. And it goes down until people figure out a workaround. And the workaround was figuring out a new way to drink socially. So social drinking seems to be related to innovation, uh, group innovation in this sense. There's also one nice direct study that shows that, so this is a, actually not just correlational, it's causation, that if you take subjects and you give them a real alcoholic drink as opposed to a fake alcoholic drink, they're more creative. Um, and their creativity peaks at about 0.08. So that's about when you have a nice buzz on, when you shouldn't operate a motor vehicle. But that seems to be the spot where you still have enough cognitive control to actually think coherently and do things that are useful, but you've been loosened up. The, the hold of the PFC has been loosened upon you in a certain way. Um, so creativity is one of the really important functions of alcohol. Another strange thing about us compared to other primates is that we are communal we're dependent on other people in a way that no other primate is. And to get anything useful done, we need to trust one another. We need to engage in long-term cooperative tasks that require trust. And when we embark upon these tasks, we run into various types of cooperation dilemmas. And these go under different types of names, you prisoner's dilemma, tragedy of the commons. They have the same structure though. You get the best payoff if you trust and you cooperate. The problem is, and this is a crucial part of the structure of these dilemmas, I don't know in advance whether or not you're gonna cooperate with me. And if you don't cooperate, if you defect, as economists put it, I'm screwed. <laughs> I get zero, you get a great payoff. And so for a rational, self-interested agent in a prisoner's dilemma game, the only strategy is to defect. So everyone defects and everybody gets that kind of bummer mutual defection outcome. In real life, people solve this all the time. We, we're constantly solving prisoners' dilemmas in our real life. And we do it because we're not rational, self-interested agents. We're emotional. 
Um, and we use emotions to help us solve these dilemmas. We have emotions like honor, like loyalty, like uh, trust that allow us, that bind us to each other in a certain way that prevent defections from happening. So emotions, the economist Robert Frank has a great book called uh, Passions Within Reason, where he explains that these love and honor and these things, they're approximately irrational. So in, in your actual psychology, they're not rational, but they have this kind of long-term rationality on an evolutionary scale. Um, so, so we use these emotions, and because emotions help us cooperate, we use them as cues to know who's a good cooperator and who's not. So when we're deciding whether or not to trust someone, we look at their emotional expressions. This is the safety net we have in cooperation. Um, I meet you, and you genuinely are happy to meet you. How do I know you're, you're genuinely happy? Because you have that smile on the left and not the one on the right. The left one is a Duchenne smile, completely different muscle system, not under, typically under voluntary control. That's the smile you make when you're serving people in a restaurant or something. <laughs> you have to be nice to them. Um, we like the one on the left, we don't like the one on the right. So we use emotional displays as a way to know whether or not to trust people. This, this opens up this, this possible risk, though, that people could be faking it. The soft spot here, again, is the prefrontal cortex. In order to lie, in order to cheat, in order to calculate, you need your prefrontal cortex in top shape. Um, lying is very difficult cognitively, right? You have to keep in, tra in your mind both what's true and what's, what you're telling the person. You have to suppress emotions that have to do with the false thing that you're not telling them about. It's, it's real, you need your PFC in top shape. Um, what's also interesting is uh, when the PFC is in top shape, we're not as good at detecting lies. And this seems to be because we look at, when we're consciously focusing on detecting lies, we're not very good at it. We look at the wrong things. It's only when we're relaxed that we actually take in uh, more information. So let's target the prefrontal cortex. With what? With our good old friend, alcohol. Right? <laughs> Down regulates the prefrontal cortex. It makes, us hard, it makes it harder for us to lie. It makes it easier for us to detect lies. And it's also simultaneously boosting some hormones like serotonin that make us less likely to cheat. So it's, it's enhancing these kind of pro-social hormones in human beings. So this is why, um, you know, when, when people, potentially hostile adults meet and have to come to some kind of agreement, they shake hands. And they're showing, I'm not carrying a weapon. When you meet with someone and you do a couple of shots, you're saying, I no longer have a prefrontal cortex. I am cognitively disarming. <laughs> and putting my prefrontal cortex on the table, you can trust me. This is why from ancient China to ancient Greece, alcohol is always at the center of uh, banquets, of treaty negotiations, anything where you have people with potentially differing interests having to agree on something. Um, all the way up to, you know, uh, Nixon told his Chinese counterpart, if we drank enough Mao Tai, we could do anything, right? <laughs> this idea that if we just disarm cognitively, we can solve these problems. And people use this informally all the time. So a cocktail party, a mixer, you're having to meet new people. You want to cognitively disarm. So we're simultaneously decreasing our inhibitions and increasing these kind of pro-social chemicals that help us like each other, like ourselves more and like each other's more. So alcohol plays this really important tool in helping people bond and helping people cooperate. This is also why when, when Skype was invented, remember back then, um, everyone predicted business travel would disappear, right? Why would you get on a plane and fly to Shanghai if you could just you know, Skype with these people to sign a contract? And yet people kept getting on planes and flying to Shanghai until the pandemic. It took a global pandemic to shut down business travel. And this is because if you're gonna enter into any kind of significant deal with another group of people, you wanna sit down and get drunk with them and eat a meal with them to get a sense of, of who they are for real. Um, so this is one of the important functions of alcohol. So in, in Drunk I Walk Through, these functional and important benefits of alcohol. But the important point is that you don't want to, admit, you don't want to lose sight of the cost of alcohol. It's a dangerous substance. It's estimated that up to 15% of the human population is prone to alcoholism. And if you have a tendency to alcoholism, you can't drink safely. Um, so it's a dangerous substance. It can lead to all sorts of chaos. But the taste for alcohol has been preserved in our species because there are these countervailing benefits.